This is a production of KMMedia.pro. Welcome back to Positive Talk Radio. Our goal is simple, to explore evolving ideas one conversation at a time. So come on over into our world. I know you'll like it, because on today's show... A young man that has been a teacher... He is a keynote speaker. He's a best-selling author. He's a coach. He's a results leader. He's an avid reader and a poor golfer all at the same time, which which means he does so many other things. He can't play enough golf to get good at it, I would guess. Um, and first of all, uh, Nathan, how are you today? Doing well for Kevin. And uh, come here for a second. Uh, let me just reach over here and... Aha! Gotcha. <laughs> what You're not you wearing get? green today, Kevin. Gotta oh, pinch you. I forgot until Danny brought it up here just a couple of minutes ago that today was actually St. Patty's Day. Yes, it is. And with a name like mine, I should I should be well aware of St. <laughs> Patty's Day. I know. What's going on, Kevin? Yeah, well, did you have plans for tonight, sir? Are you going out <laughs> on the town and color, coloring it green? Oh, near the top of the morning. Oh, very nice. Very nice. <laughs> We both have lousy uh, Irish accents, but yes, we do. <laughs> what the, what the heck? We got a great show for you today. Uh, Danny is a uh, keynote speaker, and well, I just mentioned all that. But he he works with kids a great deal, and he works with reading. He has written um, over a baker's dozens of books, and he he talks to people. He actually one of his people that he talked to said, and this is a high standard that. Uh, in my opinion, which is that he's a cross between Jim Carrey and Robin Williams. Ooh, There's a high both part. actors I was a big fan of as a kid. Yes, indeed. So, so with, without further ado, why don't we just bring it? Oh, by the way, before we begin, I want to make sure that everybody knows how to find us in all the different places that we end up. Sure. Well, of course, if you're listening to us on the radio, you know we're on 1150 KKNW, as well as on HD radio, if your car or stereo system comes equipped with it, on 98.9, and then you'll have to switch over to the HD3 channel. And then we also go on the internet at 1150kknw.com, and then you can watch us on video at Facebook for both Positive Talk Radio and 1150 KKNW's Facebook pages, or YouTube on the same platform names as well and twitter under 1150 kknw and our twiddle hand twitter handle because positive our twiddle hander twitter <laughs> <laughs> i you know one of these days i'm gonna have to learn how to speak english um, that was, that was <laughs> let's really just stick with the irish i, I think uh, we're doing better there i think we are i think you're right <laughs> and uh but uh, it's uh, positive t radio and that's our twitter handle great so in any event, let's let's bring Danny on, and I'm going to give you the honor, since you called it correctly the first time, uh, if you wouldn't mind giving us Danny's last name. Sure. Here is Dr. Danny B B Brassell. <laughs> <laughs> Still you learning here. You did it. You did it. Danny, how are you? Fantastic. Thanks for having me on, Kevin and Nathan. Uh, I really appreciate all that you do. We need a lot more positivity in the world. Well, thank you so much, and we appreciate you because you are working with uh, a demographic that needs a tremendous amount of help and guidance, and, and you work with kids a great deal. Um, yeah, I actually, I, I do all kinds of different things right now, and I have four major projects going on at once. I can't uh, figure out what I'm going to do with my life yet, Kevin. Uh, I, my, my life mission is to bring the joy back into education and workplace. And so I do that. There's four different uh, projects that I have uh, on the stove at the same time. First of all, like you said, I'm a keynote speaker. I go all around the world, uh, basically pumping up uh, teachers and principals, trying to convince them not to quit because it's a tough world out there nowadays. Uh, secondly, I have the world's uh, leading reading engagement program online, which basically in two months uh, teaches parents how to get their kids uh, excited about reading, because the more excited we get kids to read, the more likely they are to read, and the more they read, the better they get. Uh, third, um, I've been uh, uh, coaching uh, uh, business owners, entrepreneurs, executives, how to uh, uh, 
uh, create amazing presentations that uh, help sell their ideas or their products or whatever that they want, the, whatever the next step is they want the audience to take. And then finally, uh, in honor of St. Patrick's Day, during the pandemic, I connected with a, a great guy from Ireland, uh, Dermot Hudner, runs a wonderful company called Cyber Smarties, which is a social media platform for kids ages five to 12, which, which teaches kids uh, how to use social media in a positive way. It's really cool. Basically, like if you were to type me a message, Kevin, and said, Danny, I think you're ugly it won't let you send the message. Instead, it, it, it picks out that word ugly. It says, that's not a nice thing to say. What are some positive ways you can say that? And it irritates kids so much that it slows them down typing that within two weeks, they stop sending negative messages. And it's basically completely eliminated cyberbullying in Ireland. The program's now in India, it's in Egypt, it's in the UAE, it's in Turkey, it's in New Zealand. And uh, Dearman hired me to try and get the program here into the United States and spread some joy that way. So that's a whole mouthful to a, a short introduction. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm telling you, you're a busy guy. And yes. you, you uh, when you speak, you, you're doing 100 um, um, speeches a year, which means you're on the road almost probably, what, 250 days a year? That's great. I get to uh, do a lot of my reading on airplanes and there's nothing... It, I, one of my goals is to make miserable people happier, and uh, I'm in a lot of airports, and it's very easy to find a lot of miserable people in airports. Boy, you can say that again. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's crowded, and you're scared of getting COVID, you've got, uh, and uh, and people lose their minds all around you in, in an airport. you got to take your shoes off. There's yeah. so, so much wrong with all that. <laughs> That's but, right. I, I got to ask you, because you, you mentioned social media for kids, which I think is a huge, huge issue because it's right now being unfettered and, and unregulated the way it is in the United States. Kids can get away with virtually anything online mm. and do, don't they? Well, so do adults. I'd say adults are even worse than kids. Well, so, sure. you know, Microsoft had that Twitter account that they had to close down in like 24 hours because it started off... Uh, Hi, I'm, uh, I, I don't remember the name of the Twitter account, but it's like, I'm here to learn from all of you. And so it started learning from tweets and within 24 hours, it was saying Hitler was a great man and you should vote for Trump. <laughs> and it's like, whoa, what's going on? <laughs> it, it went south in a big way. Didn't it went it? south very quickly. <laughs> it's, I got to tell you, in our country right now, and uh, it's, it's a very interesting place that we are in. Yeah. And, uh, I'm hoping that with, with people like you and people like me, that we can train change the way people think about how they should behave towards e themselves and each other. Yeah, change the way people think, and they'll never be the same. Exactly. Now, one of the things that you are big on is you help both kids and all the way up to rocket scientists and CEOs, you help them with motivation and motivating their troops to uh, to do the best that they can all the time. How do you do that? Well, and you saw that my passion, Kevin's reading, it's ironic. I'm considered America's leading reading ambassador now because uh, I grew up hating reading. My father was a public librarian. I always hated the public library growing up. The furniture was always uncomfortable. It always smelled funny in there. There was always an elderly woman telling me to be quiet. There was always some freaky homeless guy hanging out by the bookshelves, thought he was a vampire. I always hated the public library. And it wasn't until I started teaching in the inner city in South Central Los Angeles, where I saw a lot of my students didn't have the advantages I had growing up. And I said, basically, shame on me. I mean, I was blessed. I grew up in a home where both of my parents were present. We were, uh, we, we weren't, we were, we weren't poor, poor, we, but we always had at least food on the table. And my parents always read in front of us kids, to us kids, and we had plenty of reading materials. And it made reading a passion of mine. And that's really what I try to show people is, uh, you know, I know I've read about plenty of uh, readers that don't necessarily become uh, effective leaders, but I've never read about an effective leader in any field that's not also an avid reader. And so really one of the best ways to motivate people is uh, words from uh, one of my mentors growing up, Charlie Tremendous Jones, who used to say, you're the same today as you will be in five years, except for two things, the books you read and the people you meet. So make sure to surround yourself with people that lift you up and make sure to feed your mind with lots of real positive books. And so that's what I try to uh, uh, impart on all of my audiences. And, you know, in, in um, 
because you're an avid reader, and I know one of one of your favorite books I looked on your website is To Kill a Mockingbird. Mm -hmm. And um, what do you what do you think of what's going on today in regards to banning books and and those sorts of things in some parts of the country? That I, I can't believe that that can be healthy for all of us. Yeah, it's not a it's not a recent phenomenon, unfortunately, Kevin. I always ask audiences, well, how many states have a banned book list? And the answer is fifty. Every every state has a banned book list. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, one of the most banned books in America right now is the Harry Potter series. And I always like to point out to people, I'm like, well, there, thank goodness we're banning Harry Potter because there's no way we should allow children to stand outside a bookstore at midnight waiting to buy a 900 page book that they want to read in two days. I mean, what's the world coming to? I always like to point out to my, my friends that have the problem with Harry Potter without Harry Potter, you don't get the renewed interest in the Chronicles of Narnia. We shouldn't ban any books from kids. Uh, there's a book that should be in every public school. They took out years ago. Let kids use that thing between their ears. Um, that's really one of the biggest problems I see in schools, Kevin, is, uh, you know, I think schools do an adequate job of teaching kids how to read. But the question I always ask people is, what good is it teaching a kid how to read if they never want to read? I teach kids why to read because I've never had to tell a kid, go watch TV. I've never had to tell a kid, go play a video game. And I never want to have to tell a kid, go read. I want them to choose to do it on their own. And so I give parents and teachers all kinds of strategies on how to help people like that. Here, I'll give a couple of tips right now. I mean. You know, when I was in high school, I was forced to read The Scarlet Letter by Nathaniel Hawthorne. And I'm not putting it down to all those people that love Nathaniel Hawthorne, but uh, the, the story is about Hester Prynne and she commits adultery. And so she's forced to wear an A on her chest. And I raised my hand in class and I asked my teacher if I could wear a B on my chest because I was so bored reading that book. And I always tell people this, the research is very clear on this. It doesn't matter what you read. It matters how much you read. It doesn't matter if you're reading James Joyce or James and the Giant Peach. People who read more read better. A tip for all the parents listening right now, the little boy who only reads Captain Underpants is going to be a better reader than the little boy who refuses to read anything. Uh, you know, Captain Underpants is the gateway drug to Shakespeare, but you got to get the kid hooked on it first. And so that's what I'm always trying to do is uh, find out what people's interests are and, and adapt my reading program based on their interests. Got to ask you, because um, when I was a bus driver, I spent 12 years being a bus driver. And I occasionally would have somebody come up to me with the schedule in their hand and say, can you tell me what time the the 150 leaves from Kent to go to Seattle? And I said, well, look on the schedule. You've got it in your hand. And they, and they would say, oh, I, no, I, I really would rather you tell me. Um, and they would they were trying to get a, around the fact that they had no idea how to read when they were going to get that. And it's, it's reading, lack of reading is a huge problem in this country, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look at our elected officials. <laughs> <laughs> well, well I, it always kills me that they that um, they can put out a bill that that is a foot thick, and uh, it's thousands of pages, and they and they say this is a good bill, but they've never read it. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunate as it is. Yeah, that's correct. Well, it's the same with uh, there was a study done years ago because uh, every year. Uh, there's a poll on the books that people claim to have read that they've never read. And so the number one book every year is the Bible. Everybody says they've actually read the Bible, but most people actually haven't read the Bible. Uh, there was a study done years ago where uh, they gave out a thousand copies of the uh, the Stephen Hawking book, um, um, A Brief History of Time. And I think around page 140, they put a little sticker in it said, if you're reading this right now, call this phone number for a check for a thousand dollars. They never got a single phone call because people <laughs> got the book, but none of them read it. <laughs> it's one of those things like when I'm, when we're looking at you um, and your backdrop, you've got a bookshelf that's full of books yeah. and I'm, I'm willing to bet a lot of them are yours. Cause you've got, yeah. how many books do you have? You got 14 or 15, 16, 16 sweet 16. Actually the, the last book I wrote was, um, so when I was a middle school teacher, I was the only teacher um, at my school not to have any tardy students because I always started off my class, I'd read a Paul Harvey story to my class. I don't know if 
If you remember Paul Harvey, Kevin, uh, he died yeah, exactly. years ago at the age of 325 years old. But <laughs> when I was a kid, every day at 1215, he'd come on the radio. And I always had to listen to Paul Harvey because he would tell you this short story. And the whole time you're trying to figure out who's he talking about or what company or whatever. But what I found is a lot of those stories are about like Sears and Roebuck. Well, kids nowadays, they don't even know what Sears Roebuck is. And so the last book I wrote uh, called Leadership Begins with Motivation, this is a book of uh, stories about companies and people that are more, more contemporary for the kids. Um, uh, after I wrote the book, though, Kevin, it was kind of interesting because I, I, I read it and I'm like, huh. Completely unintentionally, a lot of my stories, the majority of my stories are about white male Americans. And so the book I'm writing right now, number 17, is a book that features pre pre predominantly uh, females, minorities, and international examples, because I think kids need to hear about all kinds of examples from all over the world. So this is, this is the kind of stuff that turns me on is I'm always looking for a great story. I'll, I'll read a whole book that... I actually just recently read a book. It was a very long, boring book, but there was one story which made it worth the entire experience. Because like, oh, it, so it was cool. It was here's the story: was this businessman was in uh, uh, he was in South America in Chile, and he was looking for the next the next big idea. And he he had failed. He had been all around the world. He's in Chile, and he's watching these fishermen fish, and they're they're catching all these fish. And he noticed that uh, the fish that they were catching, um, they would they would send to the market. But there was this other fish that they would catch that they would eat themselves because they said it was it had a better taste. And so he ate it. And he's like, it does. It tastes better than the, the fish that you're, you're selling to the market. And he's like, what's this called? And they're like, oh, it's called the toothfish. He's like, the toothfish. That's the worst name I've ever heard. And so he renamed the fish and introduced it to American restaurants. And now it's probably the most popular uh, uh, seafood dish in America. He named the toothfish, he renamed it uh, the Chilean sea bass. And uh, <laughs> I just yeah. thought that was the greatest story. I was like, wow, this is a cool story. It was worth reading the book just for that story. <laughs> it, it, yeah, because uh, Chilean sea bass is, is a delicacy, oh, viewed yeah. as a delicacy in this country. <laughs> and, <laughs> And the thing, and they were saving the best for themselves. I, I, mm -hmm. I love that. And, which you know, I guess that's human nature. Yeah. Um, yes, you know, it's it's interesting that you've got so many books on your bookshelf. Do you have? I know you've got uh, To Kill a Mockingbird is one of your favorites. Is that is that the favorite, or do you have um, books that you can? A, a series of books that you can recommend other well you can recommend your own too because there are a lot about reading and and stuff like that but uh, yeah i'm not going to recommend my own no there's a zillion books i can recommend to people i mean like it, it depends on what kind of it's like asking your favorite movie i'm like well you can go with something artsy like the godfather you can do something funny like strange brew uh you know uh, it just depends on what you're in the mood for i mean i love it's weird that i like to kill a mockingbird because i'm not i'm not usually a guy that likes literature but gosh it's just such a beautifully written book i love scout i love atticus finch they're just great characters um uh, i love uh, the hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy by douglas adams is a short book it's, i think it's like 160 pages that was the first book to get me to laugh out loud uh, I just thought it was so funny. Um, when I was a little kid, I loved Where the Wild Things Are by Maurice Sendak. I love the pictures in that. Uh, I I mean, I read things constantly. I, I love reading, uh, I, I mean, I love reading presidential biographies. It's kind of pathetic. Uh, but uh, I absolutely love, I love David McCullough was the one, he just passed away last year. He's a wonderful author. I loved uh, Truman was a wonderful book. Uh, Team of Rivals by Doris Kearns Goodwin. I mean, um, oh yeah, I, that, that book. So the movie Lincoln is actually, they say it's based on that book. I think there's maybe four pages from the book that are actually in the movie, but they do include like they, they, they found the one good story. There's a great story in team. So team of rivals is actually a true story. President Lincoln, when he was elected, he took all of his political rivals and made them his cabinet. It would be the equivalent of Joe Biden naming Donald Trump as secretary of state. President Lincoln actually did that. It's amazing. And all these guys, they hated Lincoln's guts. And by the time he was assassinated, they were all inconsolable. They all thought, oh, we've lost the, the greatest leader this country's ever had. Lincoln had my favorite quote of any politician. He said, I know the best way to defeat my enemies. I shall make them my friends. 
that was that was just I mean Lincoln came out of nowhere. This is why I'm always an optimist because I'm like people come out of nowhere every century. It's like what? But there's a great story in the book Team of Rivals where uh, one of the founding fathers, Ethan Allen, he was appointed. I think he was like an ambassador to Britain. And so there's these British soldiers, they were playing cards with Ethan Allen one night and they decided to play a practical joke on him. And so in the uh, outhouse, they put a, uh, a portrait of President Washington. And so uh, they're playing cards all night. They, they're, they're giving him lots of coffee so that he'll have to do a number two eventually. So Ethan Allen finally goes out to, to the uh, outhouse and he comes back and uh, the British officers are snickering and they're like, uh, did you see the uh, the portrait of George Washington hanging in the outhouse? And Ethan Allen says, why, yes. And the British soldiers were taken aback. They're like, well, didn't that insult you? And he said, why, not at all. I mean, every American knows the sight of George Washington just scares the crap out of the British. And how do you... So Lincoln would tell these stories during cabinet meetings during the Civil War when there was a lot of tension. I'm like, how do you not love a leader like that who can just crack? I mean, it's like President Reagan. I, I read about President Reagan all the time, the stories that he could tell. I'm like, wow, I just love storytellers. So that's that's the kind of book I'm always looking for is like, give me a great story and you'll hook me. Uh, I mean, uh, I'm reading a whole bunch of books right now. And uh, yeah. One it, it, again, if if it has one good story, I'll stick with it. It's as that's, that's really amazing. And how would you? How do you have time to read? Is it because you're sitting on airplanes all the time? Well, I always love it. Parents will tell me, "Oh, I have no time to read." I'm like, "Oh yeah, I mean, who has time to read after you have a couple of beers? Go out shopping, watch this, watch the game on TV. I mean, who has time to read?" I have a friend who's a time management expert, and I always give him a hard time. I'm like. Well, there's really no such thing as time management. There's only uh, priority management. I mean, Harvard did a study. They found 100 years ago, people only had 24 hours in their day as well. And one of the tips I give people is make time to read. I mean, even if you just start and end the day with 10 minutes of positive reading, uh, you're getting 20 minutes a day, which over the course of a year, 365 times two, I'm not very good at math. That's almost 800 uh, minutes of reading uh, a year that I mean and think about uh, like if you look at uh, uh, just the time spent in school I think uh, the average American student I think is it's it's around 60,000 minutes per year in school but they spend on average like 85,000 minutes on some kind of screen like watching TV or on the internet I think the average American spends like around 10,000 minutes a year just on the toilet. One of the tips I give people is we'll put some reading materials next to your toilet. You might as well make it productive while you're on the toilet. So again, I'm always trying to figure out, well, how do I incorporate reading to make it into a positive habit for people? I mean, here, here's a tip I give parents. A lot of parents will say, oh, I, I have nothing to read at home. You know, I'll, I'll work with a lot of uh, parents in impoverished areas. I'm like, oh, oh, you do have something to read at home. President Bush Sr over 30 years ago signed a very important law in the United States that said every television set in America that is sold has to have closed captioning. So one of the tips I give parents is turn on the closed captioning and parents will say, well, wait a second, if the show's in English and the subtitles are in English, what good does that do? I'm like, well, that's a fair point, but let me make a point. Have you ever watched a show with subtitles and not looked at the subtitles? It's very difficult to do. Your brain's actually directed towards the text. Yeah. And there's actually research to support what I'm saying, if you if you look at reading test scores all around the world, the more kids watch TV, the lower their reading scores are in every single country on the planet except for one. The country where kids watch the most TV also has the highest reading scores in the world. It's Finland. And people always ask me, well, how can that be, Danny? I'm like, well, because Finland makes really bad TV shows. And so what they have to do is they have to import all these old American sitcoms like Gilligan's Island and Brady Bunch and put them on. And they have finished subtitles. The kids are reading the subtitles all the time. So that's a quick tip any of, any of your audience can do is just, uh, just sit there. I mean, think about this. Your audience, they're doing a great job right now. They're listening to, to a great uh, radio radio program. I always tell people, fill your mind with positive things. When I'm going on long road trips, I, I I go on one of my favorite apps is Libby, and Libby gets you access to any library in the world. You can get audio download audio books for free. And so I'll I'll go on long road trips. I just listened to uh, I just did two long road trips. One was uh, 
I listened to Will Smith's autobiography, which, you know, Will Smith, he's had a, an interesting life, but there's some really interesting stories in there. And then I listened to a biography by Matthew McConaughey, uh, Green Lights, which he narrates, and it was wonderful. There were some great stories in that in that audio book. And, you know, people have to understand, audio books count, you know, be, if, I'm one of these people that actually reads government studies, those those bills and things that most elected officials don't read. You know, so I've read like every major reading legislation of the last hundred years, you know, becoming a nation of readers, a nation at risk, why Johnny can't read, uh, the National Reading Panel, you know, the science of reading, all these things. It's great. They're always about 2,000 pages long. And it's always around page 100 where there's a paragraph that says, the research seems to suggest the single best way to improve your reading is to be read aloud to. And then it never mentions it again because that sounds way too simple. My friend and mentor who just passed away, Jim Trelease, who wrote the Read Aloud Handbook, which everybody should buy that book. Uh, Jim said, if reading aloud cost $129, every parent in America would rush out and buy it. And if we found out kids don't like it, they'd mandate it in the public schools tomorrow. It sounds so simple, but it's usually the simple things that have the greatest impact. So the long answer to your very short question is how do you find time to read? My, my challenge to everybody is how would you not find time to read? I mean, I try not to watch, I was watching this horrible show on TV the other night called uh, The News and uh, it totally depressed me. Like. Get rid of that nonsense. I watch things that my wife's always like, well, why do you watch sports all the time? I'm like, because at any moment, something positive can happen. I mean, I love watching the Olympics. And my wife gets annoyed with me because I usually root for the other other teams, not America. And she's like, why don't you root for America? I'm like, why would I, who am I going to root for? Am I going to root for the uh, the American with the microchip in his Nike shoes? Or am I going to root for the barefoot Sudanese refugee who just survived the Civil War? And they do his background story. They're like, oh, it's from uh, Nairobi. And he's like running. And he's like, I learned how to run when I was running away from the bullets in my village. I'm like, of course I'm rooting for that guy. It's an amazing story <laughs> <laughs> i gotta tell you you are you are an, an amazing man and, and you're a lot of fun to talk to you know um while you were talking i was reminiscing back now i'm um i was in grade school in the 60s and this goes back a ways and what they would do what we would do would uh, there was a library in the neighborhood mm. and so they would uh, take every they would take the class and we'd have a little field day and we would go to the library nice. and there was always a nice little old lady that would be sitting there and you she would have say old Kevin. You have to say elderly. I've learned this. Believe me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, she was an elderly lady and she was sitting there and she read to the class and everybody. And, and then she would uh, give us some uh, books that we could take back to school with us and stuff so that she was, doing that so that we would fall in love with the concept of storytelling, yeah. which is, which is really important in books. I don't think they do that anymore. Do they? Yeah, no, I mean, I like, I think, you know, I've asked literally probably over a hundred thousand people, how did you learn how to read Kevin? And I've never once had a person say, Oh, the way I learned how to read my grandma, Nana, she had this rocking chair and she'd sit me on her lap and, uh, uh, she'd have a book in her hand and we'd rock back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And Nana would smile at me and she'd point to the words on the page and say, a -a alligator, b -b ball. No, I, I've never heard a person say that's how they learned how to read. What I always hear are those types of stories, Kevin, where you had just some special person in your life, uh, you know, a relative or a, a librarian or a coach that would take the time to read aloud to you some great story. I mean, that's what, you know, I think about it. My dad always gives me a hard time about being so into reading now because I hated reading books. But like growing up, my dad would read me stories about like the founding fathers and politicians and famous people. And my mom, when we were washing and drying dishes, she was always reading stories to us or the newspaper or something. And I, I really think that that's a significant way, you know, again, the skill of people confuse the skill of reading with the habit of reading. Those are two very separate things. And to really refine your skill, you have to have the habit. But if you don't have the habit, then you have a skill that's just going to diminish over time. I mean, I have friends that 
grad, graduated from Ivy League schools that like, like to brag to me that was the last time they opened up a book. I'm like, well, you're an idiot. And I have friends that are high school dropouts that are the most well-read people. And they're the most interesting people, by the way, uh, talking about all these different ideas of different authors and things like that. I mean, that's that's what I want to listen to. And I, I constantly love these conversations with people saying, oh, have you read this? I'm like, no. And I'm like, oh, that's it's that's why I love Oprah. I mean, Oprah, I've never seen Oprah on her show say, oh, I just read this great book called Their Eyes Were Watching God. Here's what I want you to do at home. I want you to get out a piece of paper and a pen. I'd like you to write down the copyright date, the three main characters, the theme. I mean, my gosh. No, Oprah talks about books the way people talk about their favorite movies or their favorite sports teams. She gets people excited about reading. The more excited you are to read, the more likely you are to read. The more you read, the better you get. And, you know, back in the day, I had the opportunity to interview um, a guy by the name of Zary, Gary Zukov, who wrote uh, Seed of the Soul. Mm-hmm. And, and, of course, he was on Oprah's book club. That just being on Oprah's book club is what drove his sales and his notoriety into a wholly different place because everybody recognized that she was doing a great thing. By the way, Danny, we've got, we got to take a break, but we're talking with Danny Brissell. Is that is, am I close? You got it. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. And go to dannybrussell.com and you can find out all the information about him. I highly recommend if you are a CEO and you're sitting in traffic, just finished your lunch and you're on your way back to the office. I highly recommend that you you uh, call Danny and book him to come and uh, be a keynote speaker with your um, with your organization because uh in looking at his reviews it would be very helpful to you and by the way it'll make your business easier to run if you have a bunch of motivated employees that are motivated the right way and uh, danny we're going to take a break and it's only a couple minutes folks so don't go anywhere we'll be right back in about just about two minutes so uh thank you and uh, you're listening to positive talk radio on kknw 1150. hey there I'm excited that you're listening right now, and if you like what we're doing here, you're going to love PositiveTalkRadio.net. On PositiveTalkRadio.net, each show, which is recorded live, is packed with positive information, with real people discussing real issues, and positive solutions that can work for everyone. I hope that you'll join us on PositiveTalkRadio.net and listen to all 340-plus shows. I think it's worth your time. But then, that's just me. That's PositiveTalkRadio.net, your home for great progressive positive podcasts. When you want to say more than words communicate, you can with flowers. Your custom boutique floral studio in Bothell, Washington is anaturaldesign.com. Connecting you to nature through the language of flowers. Where your people are is where our flowers are beautiful. Your success is our goal. Anaturaldesign.com at your fingertips today. Hey, my friend. I'd really like to thank you for listening to the show today. As you may know, I started Positive Talk Radio way back in 2003. We were one of the first shows on KKNW. For 11 months, I was fortunate to be part of many lives, making a positive difference with great interviews and discussions, creating new thoughts and ideas. Sadly, for financial reasons, I had to terminate the show. Well, it took 18 years, but we're back better than ever. And not only on KKNW Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, but also podcasting with several inspiring channels with the same driving passion as the original. Please visit kmmedia.pro for complete information about all of these shows. In addition, if you feel called to keep positive programming on the air, you can join us by sponsoring the show and aligning yourself with our mission, which is nothing short of saving the planet and each other. Again, that's kmmedia.pro. I'll see you there. And welcome back to Positive Talk Radio. My name is Kevin McDonald. I get to be your host today, and I get to play with uh, Danny Brissell. He is an extraordinary, um, extraordinarily gifted man that is a great speaker. He's a he's an author. He's dedicated to creating joy 
everywhere he goes and it's it's really is it really is fun and that you are also a professional so um you know i'm kind of in awe of you and your and all of your gifts and what you do um so i i hope i don't you know like i don't know suck too badly but you, anyway, you can, you can be my pimp any day of the week, Kevin. I absolutely adore <laughs> you. And I, how cool is that? That uh, you got this positive media channel that's uh, supporting you and a florist. I'm like, wow. How, wh where's more joy than flowers, man? I was thinking of uh, the old book uh, Ferdinand about the bull who refused to uh, bullfight that we wanted to smell the flowers. I'm like, there's there's some joy for you. You got a florist sponsor. That's what, you need to get like Baskin Robbins next. Get some ice cream. And, <laughs> And now there's a good idea. <laughs> there, there's a good idea, and uh, we are we're, That's I, I'll go there if I don't talk to the manager. I'll talk to the employee and get some ice cream while I'm there. There, you, there. You go. I mean, go to Costco. If I was rolled doll today, I wouldn't do Charlie in the Chocolate Factory. It'd be Charlie in the Costco warehouse. Uh, I can get lost in there. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is like the greatest place on, on earth. I had a relative that got their uh, Costco membership just so that they could have uh, the samples at the end of the aisles. Oh, there that you they, go. <laughs> that they have, they would go there every day for lunch and just have samples. It. I'm not allowed to say that though. That's, but, <laughs> but, in, but in any event, what do you think, you know, you're, you're an avid reader and, um, and the books that you read are as best as you can tell uh, the truth. Um, how do you feel about, What's going on today when it is becoming, especially in the interweb, it's becoming like truth is a subjective experience depending upon who you're talking to. Um, how do we get out from under that, that, you know, I, ha I had a brother once who told me that uh, he was positive. Obama was from Kenya. Mm -hmm. I read it on the internet. Yeah. And it's, it's like, how do, how do we, get out of that and start talking about truth more well this is this is all this is what i really want to spur in everybody is natural curiosity i, I always tell people there's really no such thing as fake news there's only people that rely on one news source just because it's on one source doesn't mean that this is a fact you should educate yourself and you do that by getting lots of different points of view i mean we don't have to agree with one another that's never my intention i actually prefer being around people that disagree with me they're much more interesting uh but uh you need to you need to get facts by by i mean was, i was doing a, a talk a couple of weeks ago and some teachers were asking me about uh artificial intelligence and chat gpt and how you know kids are now going to do their book reports and all this stuff based on chat gpt and i always say well good you know we shouldn't fear technology we need to embrace it and figure out how to use it to our benefit. I mean, this this is the same argument's been going on for thousands of years. I mean, the Greeks used to argue, oh, there goes the neighborhood. They have to write things down. They can't even memorize it. You know, we're gonna start writing everything down. Well, now we're we're griping about chat GPT. And I think chat GPT is great, but just because you get it, it's getting all of its information all the, off the internet. And there's It's filled with grammatical errors and factual errors all the time. And so this is why you have to go to different sources of information. Uh, you know, I used to teach history. I love teaching history. The first thing I teach people is uh, history books are usually written by the winners. Every event yeah. in history has multiple points of view. And my job as a teacher is not to tell you what to think, it's to teach you how to think. And you should be considering different points of views and different notions. And uh, again, like in this country, it's healthy to have debate, that's fine. Where it's unhealthy is people are just rude to one another now. And so what I try to do is I try to give people some tips on how to be a little bit kinder to one another. I mean, one of the things I do now is when people cut me off on the uh, interstate, I always say a prayer that they make it to the hospital on time. Uh, we need to start being a little bit nicer to one another. People are freaking out, and it's just like, you know, life's too short. Come on. <laughs> I, I, I agree. And by, by the way, I used to have to do book reports in elementary school, and there was a movie that came out. It was called A Night to Remember, uh, the book by the same name. And so I did that book report huh. based upon watching the movie. <laughs> So I don't think it's any different now than it is. It's always, but at least they have to copy the stuff down and yeah. to read it to make sure that it makes some kind of sense. So maybe, maybe it's not such a horrible thing. Well, I was blessed when I was in seventh grade. My seventh grade reading teacher was a guy by the name of Will Hobbs, who's now a best-selling young adult author. He writes books that are especially popular with teenage boys, a lot of outdoor adventure books. 
Uh, a lot of them take place up up in the Northwest. Um, but Will was my seventh grade reading teacher in Durango, Colorado. And Will was the first teacher to get me interested in reading. He had 5,000 books in his classroom, Kevin. And every, every day at the beginning of class, he would ask us what we were reading. Uh, and then he would tell us what he was reading. And the rest of the 50 minute period, he let us read. And whenever we finished a book, we'd go up to Mr. Hobbs. He'd put down the book he was reading, look through our book, ask us three or four questions. And if he was satisfied with our answers, he gave us a point. Every book up to 200 pages was worth one point. Every extra 100 pages is worth another point. You needed 25 points to get an A. And the top five point totals had their names written on the wall. And I wanted my name written on that wall. 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea by Jules Verne. 500 page book, four point book. <laughs> also, an excellent Disney film starring James Mason and Kirk Douglas. And I didn't really feel like reading a 500 page book. So I took the book up to Mr. Hobbs. He asked me four questions. And like you, Kevin, I learned a very valuable lesson that day. Books ain't always like the movies. And guess what Mr. Hobbs did? He gave me the four points. And that's when I learned a great teaching strategy. Guilt works because I read every word of every page of every book from that point forward. Wound up with 44 points. Went well above and beyond what I had to do. He used the single greatest strategy I have ever seen a teacher use to get a kid interested in reading. He found out what I was interested in, which was football. And at least once a week, he'd come up to me with a book. He'd be like, hey, Danny, check out this book on John Elway. I know you'll like it. What are the odds I open up that book? In my experience with all age levels, 100%. Person might not read it, but they're going to open it. Also, in my experience, by the fourth time I do that with a person, they're going to try and read that book because there's nothing more... Uh, special than somebody that's important in your life, a teacher, a coach, a pastor, a parent, a buddy saying, you know what, I was thinking of you when I was reading this. And so it's those simple little things that, uh, you know, this is where I see that schools are, are, are just failing right now. Plus, you know, we're in the 21st century, man, like, <laughs> we better start catching up, man. Like, things are completely different now. I, I, I watched, I was watching a ninth grade teacher and she was given these kids these worksheets that none of the kids wanted to do. And I, I just suggested to her, I said, you know, why don't you have the kids work in groups and create like their own company and they can create a company website. And I guarantee you they'll, they'll accomplish 50 more educational objectives than what you're trying to teach. And they'll spend probably about a hundred hours of their own personal time. Cause they're actually interested in the activity, like figure out what the kids are interested in. You know, I, I was with a third grader and his teacher told me he didn't understand math. I'm like, really? Because the, the kid just told me every single statistic about Kobe Bryant. He <laughs> understands math. Show him how to use it in a fun way. I mean, this is, in this country, we're crazy. I mean, we graduate high school students. They understand calculus. They just don't understand how to balance a checkbook. I mean, I'm not saying calculus isn't important, but... Ask Congress if balancing a checkbook is an important thing. I mean, like there are basic things that we need to to get. And I, 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 I guess I'm starting to sound more and more like an old guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, because it's like um, when I when I was in uh, again in in elementary school because I was in a private school that went to eighth grade, and we would have two classes in the same room. So we'd have seventh and eighth, fifth and sixth, and seventh and eighth were in the same well when they were when he was working with the seventh graders or vice versa and i would go over to the bookshelf and there was something there called an encyclopedia now if you don't know what an encyclopedia is they used to have people that would actually walk around the neighborhood selling encyclopedia books for people to take and put them in their home i don't even know that they make them anymore yeah, um, <laughs> and, and so i would grab you know like a or b or c and i would you know just sip through the whole thing and i learned a ton about history and different things and 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 then i could determine what my own interests were of what i wanted to learn and then i would go more in depth on those things and those people and those historical figures and and all of that it was it was very very important we don't do that anymore i don't think well because we're not we're not building on people's interest you have to find that little spark that's going to ignite inside every person everybody's interested in something and everybody 
unfortunately, our minds, uh, you know, I love the quote by Michelangelo. He said, the greater danger for most of us is not that our aim is too high and we miss it, but that it is too low and we reach it. I always tell teachers, your students are going to achieve precisely what you think they're going to achieve. So once you set your sights high and be dazzled as those kids reach for the stars. I was giving a talk in India, in Chennai, India, and uh, I was pumping up the kids and the teachers, getting them all smiling. And I had this little boy, six-year-old boy, come up to me afterwards. He had tears in his eyes. And I noticed he's missing his left arm. He has a stump for his left arm. And he looks up at me and he's like, uh, how can I succeed? And I got down to his level, Kevin. And I said, you know, when I was your age, I went to 18 different schools before sixth grade. Everybody called me stupid because I stuttered. And finally, I went to school where a teacher took some interest in me and she spent one on one time and she would sing things to me and I would sing them back and I didn't have my stutter. It was kind of like the movie, The King's Speech. And eventually I lost my stutter and I became a swan. Uh, but I looked at that little boy and I said, I want you to think about this. Isn't it interesting that that little boy everybody called stupid and said couldn't talk right now gets paid vast sums of money traveling around the world to do what? To speak. And you should have just seen the grin on his face. I think that's what everybody needs. I was very blessed in my life to have two parents that encouraged me all the time, Kevin. I mean, my wife is from Singapore. She grew up in the most negative environment possible. People telling her what she couldn't do her entire life. Whereas I have a, a, a childhood photo of me when I was four years old wearing space boots, a San Diego Chargers jersey, a sheriff's badge, and a fireman's helmet because I was going to be the first ever astronaut, professional football player, police officer, and firefighter. I mean, that's the world I grew up in. And I, I wish everybody had that kind of world where you had people encourage you. That's why people should be listening to this show. Hear about the good things. I mean, they say garbage in, garbage out. My friend Keith Harrell, who passed away, he was a wonderful speaker. I agree with him. He said, no. Garbage in, garbage stays. You have enough people telling you, you you can't, you start to believe it. But I also believe you have enough people telling you you can, you start to believe that as well. So be very wise and fill your mind with people that are lifting you up all the time. You know, one of the big one of the big things we talk about here is that that people, you know, uh, Danny, there are people that are listening to this conversation and they're saying, man, he's intelligent. He's smart. He's done all these things. He's he, he travels around the world. It must be just awesome to be him. And then in the course of the conversation, it comes out that you, when you were a child, you were a stutterer. Mm -hmm. And now you're using your voice and to make a hell of a living. And we all have got that same thing going on. There are things about us when we, then as we're growing up that we don't think that we can overcome. And it's a matter of mindset. Your mindset was, screw that, I'm going to overcome this. And now I'm, mm -hmm. I'm going to read and I'm going to do all these things. And so that is a lesson into and of by itself that you can do all that you're doing. And even, even though you had one arm when you were growing up or you were a stutterer and, mm -hmm. and, and it, it's, it's amazing what you can accomplish if you well, absolutely can. I, I mean, even like, so Tuesday I'll be, what I do is usually once or twice a month, I work on zoom with about eight to 10 entrepreneurs and um, uh, business owners. So these are people that aren't professional speakers and over the course of either one day or two days, we craft what I call their stump speech. I've heard people call it a signature talk. It's basically showing them the recipe on how to create a compelling presentation that teaches people how to take the next step with you, whether it's to buy your product or to uh, enroll in your cause or to even uh, change their behavior because they accept your idea. Uh, it was great. I was working with this guy about two months ago, Gustavo from Ecuador. He's like the great American success story. He comes here to this country, doesn't speak a word of English. Now he's a big real estate mogul. He has a coaching program that he offers uh, people, uh, investors, how to how to invest in real estate. It's a four month program, costs forty thousand dollars. Well, we crafted his talk, and uh, one of the things I always I, I always tell people, I'm like, well, there's two ways to become a better speaker. First of all, you need to watch lots of speakers, and uh, I mean, I watch speakers all the time. Uh, one of the tips I give people is to to watch award shows. I always watch the Academy Awards because. People only have 45 seconds to give a speech. And I always, I always want to see if the person gives a good speech. Now, most of them don't. Most of them will say, oh, oh, oh thank you, God. Thank you, my agent. You know, 
But every now and then you get somebody who gives a great speech. And I, I give the example last year, and unfortunately I can't remember the gentleman's name. Uh, I'm going to call him Kevin McDonald. So he won the Academy Award hey. for best film editing. And so nobody in the audience wants to pay attention to his speech. And he gets up there. He's a British guy. He's like, a lot of people don't know this, but when phrased properly, the term Academy Award nominee can be used as an insult. Well, now people are laughing and they're paying attention. And he says, for example, yesterday I got in an argument with my 17 year old daughter and she said, well, Academy Award nominee, Kevin McDonald, you know, and all of a sudden everybody in the audience is laughing. This guy, he gets off stage, Sondra Bullock wants to meet him, Brad Pitt wants to meet him, like that's the power of a good speech. And so that's the first tip I always give people when you're trying to learn how to speak, you gotta watch speakers. The second thing is you gotta do the work. One of my uh, mentors, Jim Rohn, used to say, you can't pay other people to do your push-ups. You gotta practice, you gotta go out there and speak to Rotary Club, Lions Club, Optimus Club, Kiwanis Club, speak to the elementary school, speak to the synagogue, to the church, get out there, go on podcast. And so Gustavo, he had a $40,000 offer. This is a pretty big ask for an audience. And that night he was going on a podcast and he said, should I practice? I'm like, absolutely, make the pitch, do it. Do it exactly the way we wrote it. So he calls me up the next day, Kevin. I need to start charging people a lot more for these seminars. He's all excited. He's like, Danny, Danny, I made the pitch last night. And I'm like, did you sell any? He's like, 23. What? Kevin, I'm not a math major, reading's my thing. I believe $40,000 times 23 is $920,000. He made almost a million dollars on a podcast using a speech we had crafted that afternoon. And I love that. That guy did what most people don't do. He freaking did something. Most people, they listen. I always like, so whether I'm teaching, I've taught all age levels. I always tell people, whether I'm teaching my little ones or my older ones, as they leave my classroom, they always have to hear the same refrain every single day. I tell them, remember kids, education is valuable, but execution is priceless. Knowledge is not power. Only applied knowledge is power. Knowing what the right thing to do and doing the right thing are two very different things. So go out into this world, do the right thing, and make this world a better place. Everybody has to hear that every single day from me. But you say it enough, kids start remembering that all the time. Like it's like you can have all the books on the shelf you you want, but if you don't read them, that's called shelf help, not self help. You need to actually read the book, and then you have to apply the principles. So if there's one thing I want your listeners to do out there is when you're listening to Kevin's broadcast every week you know, take action, take at least one item, one priority and figure out how you can change a behavior. I want you, if you're listening to this right now, I want you to remember the date that this is on, which is St. Patty's Day. Yes, I, want you, I want you to remember because what you just heard is a nugget that you can take and live your entire life by, and it will change something that is something that will change everything. So if you want to listen to this again, go to positivetalkradio.net or, or YouTube and, and listen and look for uh, Danny Brassell and, and you, you will be, and, and give it to your friends because it's somebody who's interested in changing their life. Because what Danny just said is something that you can take every day, put it into your little back pocket and use it every day, and it will change your life if you want it to. Do you well, that's that? one thing uh, you just reminded me, Kevin, I, and I, I just so appreciate you having me today. Is, uh, I wanted to give everybody uh, a couple of gifts for paying attention to me today. Uh, 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 <laughs> one of my mentors was uh, Zig Ziglar, who's a wonderful okay. law speaker. You know and, everybody. Oh, well, Zig is great. Zig always said something which meant a lot to me. He said, uh, you know, motivation is like bathing. It's temporary. That's why we suggest you do it regularly. And so I can get everybody pumped up today, but I need to get you to, to stay in that positive frame of mind. So I want to give everybody a couple of freebies. So if you go to freegiftfromdanny.com, again, freegiftfromdanny.com, I'm going to give everybody two things. First of all, you'll all get a complimentary e-copy of my book, Read, Lead, and Succeed. This is a book I wrote for a school principal who was trying to keep his faculty and staff positively engaged. So I said, okay, I'll write you a book. Uh, so every week I give you a concept, an inspirational quote, an inspirational story, 
a book recommendation on a book you should read, but you're probably too lazy because you're an adult. So I also give you a children's picture book recommendation, demonstrates the same concept. You read that in five minutes. Uh, that's to keep you, uh, and you know, now it's, I love it because I have all these executives now are starting off their meetings every week using like a Dr. Seuss book. I'm like, that's great. The <laughs> second thing I'm gonna give everybody is last summer I did a five day reading challenge online for about 700 families around the world where every day, for one hour for a week, I'm going to give you an hour's worth of ideas on ways to get your kids excited about reading. Because once again, the more excited we get kids to read, the more likely they are to read. And the more they read, the better they get. My, my reading habit program, uh, in just over two months, we get kids to read more, read better, and most importantly, to read better. So if you just go to freegiftfromdanny.com, you'll get both of those goodies from me. And I, I just appreciate everything you do, Kevin. I, I I always tell people you need to surround yourself with that positivity. Stay away. You know, uh, there's a great line in uh, Harry Potter by J.K. Rowling. She says, don't let the muggles get you down. And I love that. There's there's people that they just love being miserable. And I, I you know, I'm like, I'm so glad that that person works, works at that toll booth. They're just a miserable human being and they need to be isolated from society. Uh, keep yourself surrounded by the positives. And that's wonderful advice and and the name of that website is because somebody was fumbling for a pencil free gift I'll, I'll write it in your little chat thing uh, free gift from danny.com my my name's really easy it's danny brissell my last name is spelled bras cell no i never took any grief over that as a child it's very easy to remember <laughs> I, can, I can only imagine i can only imagine danny thank you will you come back and see me again Anytime, Kevin. You're your positive energy. We'll have to figure out. I guess next time it has to be on Easter or Valentine's Day or something. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Again, we've been talking to Danny Purcell. Go to dannybursell.com. I want to thank you so much for being here. And remember, everybody, be kind to one another because each other's all we've got. We'll see you next time on Positive Power.